So this morning we're kicking off this new series, and the series is called Suit Up, Being Battle Ready. And I know that sort of sounds sort of military-like, it sounds sort of warfare-like, and the reason behind that is because the topic that we're going to be looking at as we walk through this series is spiritual warfare. You know, one of the things that uh, we, we begin to realize as we study the Bible is that the Bible has a lot to say about the spiritual battles that we face as Christ followers. Maybe you uh, have never really recognized some of the hardship that you face in life as being a spiritual battle. But the Bible's very clear that that's some of the things that we face as we live out our life walking in Christ Jesus. And so we, we begin to study God's Word. We begin to understand the, the, the need for us to understand what spiritual warfare really is. If we were to go back to the Gospels, and we go specifically to Matthew chapter 4, we begin to see where Jesus himself, as he was beginning to launch his ministry, faced uh, the temptation from an enemy who sought to destroy him. And that is, we all know, that is the devil, Satan, uh, is someone who came to him and approached him. And the scriptures tell us that he led Jesus into the wilderness. And it was there that he began to tempt Jesus. Now, we know the story. We know the story was one that ended in, in, uh, in victory for Jesus and ultimately for us because Jesus was able to resist the temptation of the devil. He was someone who lived on this earth and never sinned. And so praise God for that. But, but no doubt he was tempted by the devil. But what we need to understand is that in that temptation, temptation is not a word that we need to make light of. Because the realities of what Jesus was going through was absolute spiritual warfare. In fact, after that time where Satan was tempting Jesus and Jesus ultimately told him to be gone, what we see next is that the Lord sent angels to minister to Jesus because of the hardship that he had faced. Well, you and I as Christ followers, we face some of those same battles. We face that same enemy who wants to destroy our life, that same enemy who seeks to destroy who we are as Christ followers, to destroy our families, to destroy our biblical community, uh, our, our faith family. And, and he, he looks to just bring chaos into our life rather than order. So we're going to be looking at that as we walk through this series. And to start things off, I want to sort of present to you that there are basically two ways that I believe that we get it wrong when it comes to spiritual warfare. The first uh, thing that I would say is that oftentimes we underemphasize spiritual warfare. The other is to say that we overemphasize spiritual warfare. As we dive into God's Word and we study this, uh, the, the truths concerning spiritual warfare, we begin to understand that the, the biblical understanding or interpretation of spiritual war warfare is somewhere in the middle. Middle. Sometimes it, people will just completely ignore the, spir the spiritual realm uh, and, and the battles that we face uh, against spiritual powers. While at the same time, others will blame every sin and every trouble and every conflict and every problem on demons that need to be cast out of somebody. C.S. Lewis spoke of this in his book, the screw tape letters, and he said these words. He says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. You know, for Jesus, we see this spiritual battle take place in Matthew's gospel. We see it unfold. We get to sit in the stadiums, as it were, and to watch what happens as we see this spiritual battle take place between good and evil. But what we also begin to notice is that for Jesus, the Word of God becomes the most powerful weapon that He uses against Satan. The Word of God. In fact, all three times when Jesus was tempted by the devil... We see where Jesus responds to Satan by saying, it is written. And he goes on to offer instruction to the devil. 
And so the Word of God becomes vitally important to us as we think about as we think about the, the need to study the Word of God, to understand the Word of God, so that we can be ready as we suit up and put on our spiritual armor and we begin to go out into the world and live our life and to fight for our family, to fight for our church, to fight for our freedom in Christ Jesus and ultimately carry the gospel message around the world that others would know Jesus like we know Jesus. And so this is the reason we study these things. This is the reason that we, we dive into the Word of God to understand so that we may live our life understanding the true uh, abundant life that Jesus spoke to when he, when he saved us. And so we look into God's Word and we see that. I want to invite you this morning to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin this morning starting with verse 10 and we're going to read through verse 13. And next week we're going to really dive into the armor of God, which is 14 and following. But today what we're going to be talking about, what we're going to be looking at is the real enemy that we face. And this becomes very important for us to understand. There may be some of us here today that, that, that really don't understand that really don't believe in 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 a, in a war that we may be fighting against evil and then there's others that are here today that this is all you think about but the realities are as a church we need to understand what the bible teaches us about these things and so ephesians chapter 6 starting with verse 10 will be our text you know since we're starting at the end of this book, this letter, this epistle that Paul wrote, we're starting in chapter 6. I, became, I, I believe it becomes important for us to, to just uh, dive into a little bit of context before we look at this particular text. You see, in this epistle that Paul was writing to the church in, in Ephesus, it follows a pattern that we often see in Paul's epistles. An epistle is simply a letter that Paul has written to a local body. And so this epistle is not a lot different than all the other epistles that he has written. We begin to see as we study these epistles that they follow a pattern. And, and what I mean by that is that they are very doctrinal and theological in their nature. We begin to realize that as we read the epistles that Paul wrote, that, 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 that the Scripture teaches us and defines for us what it means to be a Christian. We begin to learn that as believers and followers of Christ Jesus, that our identity is in Christ Jesus. That's who we are. In fact, the Scriptures teach us that in being a disciple of Christ, we are really nothing more than little Christ. We're Christians, and that's literally what that word means. And so we learn a lot about Jesus we learn the theological implications of who he is, and, and, and we learn a lot about uh, his nature and his purpose as he lived on this earth. We understand about his divine nature, his, the reality that he is deity, that he is God. He is fully man, but he was fully God. He is fully God. And so we learn those theological truths. At the same time, we continue to dive into the epistles and we understand and we read uh, this long list of benefits and blessings that we have in being a follower of Christ. We understand that we have these blessings uh, and they belong to us because we belong to Christ. How many of you are thankful for the life that you have in Christ this morning? Anybody thankful for the life that you have in Christ? The work that Jesus is doing in your life. These are things that are worth celebrating here today. But in this epistle, what we begin to see is that we are challenged. We are challenged in sort of a unique way. Because you see, what Paul does as he's writing to the epistles is he spends a lot of time talking about the reality that as a believer, as a follower of Christ, we are walking out our faith with Jesus. We are walking in a relationship with Him. We begin to see the language that Paul uses as he describes that, this. When he says to us in, in this letter to the epistles, he says, walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel to which you have been called. And so he talks a lot about us walking out, living out our life in Christ Jesus. But here's what we need to understand. 
as we study what it means to walk with Christ, we, we have to be careful that we don't take the walk lightly. That we don't look at how we're living out our life in Christ Jesus and make light of that as though it was a walk in the park. If you're a believer and you've been a believer for any length of time, you realize that, that life is always full of surprises, that life is always full of ups and downs. And oftentimes we don't put a lot of thought into where those problems come from. We don't often see that our, our lives are under spiritual attack from an enemy who seeks to destroy. And so Paul as he's talked about all these theological issues of who Christ is, as he's laid out to us very, uh, very much the doctrinal truths that we need to study, as we've come to understand who we are as Christ followers and that we are called to walk worthy, he quickly moves into, as he comes to the end of his epistle, talking about a truth that becomes very important to us as believers and followers of Christ. Walking may seem easy, but what we're about to see is that walking can be very challenging, walking with Christ. And so read with me, if you will, starting with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. So here's what the Word of God says. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. If you are a believer, if you are a Christ follower, then there is a particular truth that is very important for you to remember. If you're a follower of Christ... There are a lot of truths for us to remember, but there is one that you need to understand clearly today, and it's this. As a Christian, the devil is committed to your destruction. If you are a believer, a follower of Christ, someone who has surrendered your life to Christ, and you have cried out to him and you say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I will follow you wherever you lead. If this is your life, if you are a committed believer and disciple of Jesus, then you must understand that the devil is committed to causing all of that to fall apart. That's what Paul is presenting to us in this passage. You see, what Paul realizes is that the devil once had you, but as a believer and follower of Christ, he now doesn't. We celebrate that truth, don't we? We know that Jesus has rescued us from the grip of Satan. We understand that we were once dead in our trespasses, but today we are alive in Christ Jesus. How many of you celebrate with me this morning that you are alive in Christ Jesus? You're no longer walking dead in your trespasses, but Jesus has made you alive. He has set us free from, from the sin in our life. And so here we see where Paul is bringing this incredible truth to us. And he is laying out for us this, this need for us to understand what we are up against. I think one of the most important things in any kind of warfare is knowing your enemy. Our troops... And I think we're, we're all thankful that we get to live in a, in, a, in a town that supports a military base here, the Air Force, and, and, and I love meeting our troops. And it's, it's just always an honor to me to, to meet those who are serving. But they would never go to war without knowing who their opponent is. They would never go to the fight without understanding what they're up against. The Apostle Paul here, he he wants us to understand what we as believers, as we walk out our faith in Christ Jesus, what we're up against. 
And so he gives us this truth. He, he helps us to understand. He offers to us this insight. And I want to dive into that this morning so that we may understand what we're up against. So Paul starts out in verse 10, and he uses a word that might have a different meaning to you this morning than what it really means as we dive into the text. Paul starts off and he says this. He says, finally. That's the first word he uses. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Now, what Paul doesn't mean by this word finally is finally we have come to the end of this letter. Uh, maybe like some of you are sitting here thinking it toward the end of this message, finally the preacher is almost done, right? That's not what this word means. What Paul is meaning by this word finally is he comes to this, to this part of his discourse as he is presenting to us that everything he has spoken about, everything that he has presented in the form of a letter and what we know is truth of God's word, all these theological truths that he has presented, all this doctrine he has given us, all these ways of living out our life, he comes to the end of the text and this letter that he is writing and by using this word he is presenting to us the grand finale of what he wants to say to the Ephesians and ultimately to us. And so when he uses the word finally, he's not just saying, man, I'm glad I'm almost done with this letter. He's saying to them, I hope you'll pay attention because these last few words that I have to offer are very important for you to understand. And so here's what Paul says. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You see, what Paul does first, as he lays out this text to us, is he reveals a lot of important things for us to understand. And one of the first things that he reveals to us is the source of our strength. Because you see, as believers and followers of Christ living out our life in this world, we're going to need a strength that is beyond our own abilities. Amen? We're going to need that. If we're going to get through this thing called life, as difficult as it is, we're going to need the strength of the Lord. And so what Paul says here, the first point that he wants to bring to us is the source of our strength. And he says here very clearly, finally, be strong in who? Be strong in the Lord. He goes on and he says, and in the strength of his might. You see, here's the problem. None of us, not you, not me, none of us here possesses the spiritual power within ourselves that we need to overcome the war that the devil wages against us. We just don't have it in us. Not spiritually. The reality is, as believers and as people, we are weak, we are fallible, we are even foolish at times. And the devil is very much aware of that. And so the battle that we face, if we choose to face that battle in our own strength, we're going to fail every time. And so Paul, he, he wants us to understand that we are very dependent upon what? The strength of the God whom we pledge allegiance to. The strength of the Lord whom we surrender to. The strength of Christ who has saved us and delivered us from sin. And so Paul makes it very clear that we are very dependent upon the Lord. So what exactly does he mean when he says, be strong in the Lord? Well, let me tell you what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean, uh, he doesn't mean trying to build up your own strength. He, he's not talking about you getting in your prayer closet and working on yourself. That you have it within you to build up the strength within you. Again, he's pointing back to the strength that can only be had in Christ Jesus. As believers, we cannot strengthen ourselves in the Lord Rather, we must be empowered, we must be strengthened, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who, 
lives within us. And so he, he's not pointing to us working out so that we can be stronger as people and battle the one who comes against us. In fact, what we see in the Scripture, and this is very important, this is, this is exciting to me, but what we see in the Scripture is that God often delights in demonstrating His power in situations where people don't have the strength. Have you ever noticed that when we see significant battles in the Bible, that God often chooses the least of the least to fight those battles? Have you ever noticed that? He doesn't go to the greatest warrior and call him into service to go and fight for him, does he? In fact, what we see time and time and time again is that the Lord goes to the weakest of the weak. We see this in Gideon when the, when, when the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and he says, he calls Gideon and he says, oh mighty warrior. And Gideon responds and he says, me? No, you got the wrong guy. You see, you see, I don't know where you got your information from, but I'm the weakest of my family. And my family is the weakest of the clan. And, and our clan is the weakest of all the nation." No, if you're calling me mighty warrior, you obviously have it wrong, but God used Gideon in a powerful way. What about King David? You remember when David goes up against Goliath, do you realize he was the weakest of all his brothers? He was a guy who was able to go and defeat the great Philistine in the name of the Lord. But you see, what we see in that story is there wasn't physical strength that took this man down. It was a strength that David had in the Lord long before he ever went to the battlefield. It is the inner strength that he had to be able to trust the Lord in the midst of an impossible situation. And so all through Scripture, we begin to see that what God seemingly delights in is being able to demonstrate His power in our weakness. The Apostle Paul knew that. The Apostle Paul is no doubt warning the Ephesians to be ready, to suit up, if you will, to be prepared for the spiritual battles that they will face. And no doubt they need to find their strength in the Lord. But I want you to listen to what he said when he wrote to the Corinthians. He wrote these words. He said, he said to me, speaking of the Lord, he said, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Not in strength. In what? In weakness. He says, he says, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul speaking, he says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, what? Then I am strong. Paul says, I'm okay with admitting that I am weak. I'm okay with admitting that I don't have what it takes to fight the spiritual battles in my life, nor the physical battles that may come in my life. Because I have a greater one to lean upon. I have another that I will turn to, and his name is Jesus. That's why Paul can so boldly stand and say, when I am weak, I am strong. And so here we begin to see where Paul, as he's writing to the Ephesians, he's sort of laying all of this out. Now, there's another thing that Paul wants us to know as well. As he's writing to the Ephesians, he also wants us to know our enemy and how he works. It becomes very important that we understand who the enemy is that we are fighting these spiritual battles with. Look at verse 11 with me. He says this, he says, put on the whole armor of of God. Now, you may have questions about that. We haven't read through the rest of the text. We will study that next week as we dive into what the armor of God is all about. But I don't want to go there just yet. He says in verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of who? Of the devil. Of the devil. And so here we have Paul revealing to us 
who exactly our enemy is. He goes on to show us how he works. And one of the things that we need to understand about the devil, as we read through the scripture, we, we can take away so much information about who he is, but one of the things that we need to understand, probably of great importance, is that the devil is the enemy of God. And so if the devil is the enemy of God, then we as followers of Christ, children of God, are also his enemy. You see, the devil stands against everything that God stands for. The devil is, is waging war constantly against God. He hates God and he wants to destroy God. And therefore, he wants to destroy any who follow him. It becomes very important for us to understand who our enemy is. It becomes very important for us to understand exactly who the devil is. This isn't a lesson celebrating the devil at all. It's just simply a lesson to help us understand what we need to know as we put on the full armor of God in preparation for the spiritual warfare that whether we like it or not, we're a part of. You see, according to the Scripture, the devil is the source of all evil. And what we begin to realize as we read through the Scripture is that sin first revealed itself in the heart of a creature known as Lucifer. Lucifer determined that he would, that he would stand against God, that he would be God. And so he went to, to war with God. That he, he, he desired more than anything else to exalt himself above God. But Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan, a.k.a. the devil, he was defeated. And he was ultimately cast out of heaven along with the falling angels who were following Lucifer. And today, Satan continues to try everything he can to dethrone God, our God. He tries everything he can to rob God of his glory. My friends, that is our enemy. He is ancient, he is powerful, he is deceptive, and he is experienced. And he wants to ruin our life. He has been attacking and deceiving and defeating people, followers of Christ since Adam and Eve. He is an evil one. And this is the one that we come up against as believers and followers of Christ. Now Paul, he lets us know who the enemy is, but then he goes on, he continues to help us understand what it is that he is doing, how it is that he works. He says in verse 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You can't read that verse and not begin to sense that this is serious business for the follower of Christ. This is serious. It is something that we need to understand and to learn. And I love the way Paul uses certain words to get across the importance of learning this, this truth that he is presenting. Paul starts out in verse 12, and he uses a word, wrestle. He says here, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And I want you to understand clearly what he means when he uses this word, wrestle. You know, we may sort of perceive something a little differently than what the intentions of the apostle Paul were when he used the word. You know, most of you here know I'm a granddaddy. I have four grandchildren. And I love to play with them. They love me more than anybody else in the whole world, including their parents. I like to pretend. But they come into the house and they run to me, every one of them, and they, they just latch on. And, 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 and I believe the reason they latch on to their granddaddy, aside from the fact that they love me more than life itself, is because I play with them. I love to get on the floor with them. I love to play 
being transparent here, Barbies with my granddaughters, right? I mean, it's not that I love the Barbies so much, just the time with my, you know what I'm talking about. I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. But I love playing with them. But on the floor with grandchildren, you probably know this as parents too, if you get on the floor with your children, it's going to probably turn into a wrestling match. And my grandchildren, all four of them, love to wrestle. In fact, when they get together, they think it's on. We're going to take granddaddy down. And they love, and I love to pretend like they're winning the game. You know, like they're, they're taking me down. I'm the big guy that's going down, and they pile on. And it's a beautiful time, and they just think they've won until I just sling them across the room. And I love to do that, right? That's not the image that the Apostle Paul is presenting to us when he says we wrestle against spiritual forces, against a darkness. This word wrestle in its original language in the Greek, it, it literally means hand-to-hand combat. And it refers to a combat that exists with swords and axes and spears. It involves stabbing and slashing and chopping. It's a, it's a horrible warf- warfare that has taken place. When he uses this word wrestle, everyone who would have read this would have understood that this is serious, serious business. Today in modern warfare, we shoot bullets long distances, oftentimes hardly even seeing our enemy, but But in the medieval day, those days where they came together and they clashed and it was bloody battle. When Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers and present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil. My friends, this is serious. Now, I hear the music, so that means this message is almost over, right? I've got three more minutes, and I'm going to give you the good news that Paul presents to us in the remainder of this passage. You see, the last thing that Paul reveals to us is our hope in the midst of our battle. Our hope in the midst of our battle. He says in verse 13, he says this, he says, Therefore, Take up the armor of God. I, I want you to know something. As you, as you hear all this horrible news, as we start to envision this, this spiritual warfare and, and think of the battle that is raging all around us and oftentimes in our own life, I want you to know that there is hope. Because many of us may be sitting here and say, Pastor David, I'm going through a battle just like you're describing, and I don't see an end to this thing. I don't see how this thing's going to turn around. I don't know how this thing's going to have a, a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know how to fight this battle. Paul says here, he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, listen to this, to stand firm. You know, many of us have read through Ephesians 6. We're very familiar with the story of the armor of God, and we know many of us can even think about what the armor of God is. You've already kind of raced ahead maybe in your mind. You know where we're going with this message. But here's what I want you to do today. I want you to, I want you to just slow down for just a moment, and I want you to think about what Paul's saying in verse 13 before we get to verse 14. You see, Paul says this. He says, take up the whole armor of God. Before we get into the armor, we got to understand what we're really talking about here. And what we're really talking about is the dependency that we have on the holy and the righteous Father who cares deeply for us as believers. 
and children of God, enough so that He would give us what we need to fight the battles that we fight. The emphasis isn't on the armor. The emphasis is on God Himself. So we put on the whole armor of God. And if we were to go all the way back to verse 3, we see where Paul gives us this at the beginning of this text. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Lean into the strength of His might. Verse 13, and take up the whole armor of God. Why? Because it's only then that we can fight the spiritual battles that we face. It's only then that we're able to withstand in the evil day. It's only then that we can stand firm as we face an adversary who wants to destroy us and our family and our church. And make no mistake, He wants to destroy us. I want to share with you real quickly something, just be a little bit transparent with you. I don't, I don't like exposing my weaknesses to you because I know that many of you look to me as the spiritual leader of our faith family. And, but I'm going to just be honest with you. The last three years of my life have been some of the hardest years of my life. I have fought many spiritual battles. There have been times where I didn't think I was going to make it. There have been times in my life where I thought I needed to wave the white flag. There have been times in my life where I just needed to quit, where I just needed to move on. Nothing would satisfy me more than to just ride off into the sunset. Because the battles were that difficult. I've experienced more spiritual warfare in the last three weeks of my life than I have the entirety of the rest of my life. And I know all the right answers. I, I tell myself, well, you know, Dave, this is, this is spiritual warfare. The devil just wants to put a stop to what's happening here at Cross Point. I know those answers. I know those truths. But I'm telling you this because it is difficult. It is hard. And I know that many of you are going through some of the same sorts of spiritual battles in your own life because many of you have shared with me the spiritual battles going on in your life. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Ephesians because he wants them to know that there is a war that is being fought and you are in it whether you want to be or not. And the only way you're going to survive this is by trusting God in the hope that you have in the midst of the battle. One of the verses that really just brought a lot of healing in my life is James chapter 4, verse 7. I must have read this a thousand times. And it says very clearly these, this. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil he will flee from you. What a powerful truth. Where James is basically revealing everything that we have just studied in this passage from Ephesians where Paul says there's a dependency that is needed in the Lord. In other words, if I could say it even more simply, you need Jesus in your life. And you know this. You need Jesus in your life if you are going to survive this thing, if your family is going to survive this thing. You can't run from those problems. You can't run from those battles. Let me tell you why. Because there's just more battles waiting for you wherever you go. You need to learn to stand firm. You need to learn how to withstand. And we've just learned how today. Because the way we do that is by submitting our life to Christ. Submitting our life to God. So that we can resist the devil. It's pretty clear, isn't it? 
It's not easy. It's not a walk in the park. If you're a new believer here today and you think, man, I gave my life to Christ because I'm ready for some easiness in my life, guess what? It just got more difficult. But it's the greatest blessing that you could ever walk in is knowing Jesus and knowing that He cares so deeply for you, that He has empowered you with the strength that you need to get through every single day of your life. And I know that I'm not the only one in this room that needs more of that in my life. I know that all of us in this room need a little more of Jesus in our life. Amen? You see, Jesus isn't just our ultimate example in the fight that we face. He is our hope in the center of our battles. I'm going to pray for us, and and as I do, I, I hope that you will take heart what we've talked about today. And if you're here today, and maybe for the first time in your life, you, you're sitting here thinking, you know, I, I don't know that I'm a believer. Our pastor's down front, I'm down here. If you have questions about salvation, we would love to try to help you find the answers to your questions. Maybe you're here today and you've come to realize that prayer is something that you need more than anything. Just that time with God and our, our altar is open to come and just get on our knees before God and to pray. And maybe start with just thanking God for what He's done in your life already. And to acknowledge to Him that, Lord, I'm dependent upon you and I need more of you in my life. And so, Father, I'm here. I'm here to surrender and to say, Lord, come into my life. and with you bring healing maybe you have other questions our pastors are down front we're here for you but the most important thing that you need to understand as we get ready to stand up and sing this last song is that you have an opportunity right now to respond to the Holy Spirit who's moving in your hearts maybe in a way he never has before and I pray that you would be bold enough to take that opportunity and respond to God in whatever way might be your greatest act of 